Hello, I'm Lori Murphy, Assistant Division Director for Executive Education at the Federal Judicial Center. Welcome to our podcast focused on executive leadership in the judiciary. In today's episode, we'll talk with someone intimately familiar with two provocative and interrelated concepts, courageous followership and intelligent disobedience. All of us had the opportunity to transform our organizations, not just from positions of leadership, but from the vantage point of what our guest calls courageous followership. Courageous followers help implement a leader's vision while simultaneously allowing those leaders to become more successful. Yet there are times when blind obedience can be dangerous to our organizations and institutions. During those times, what we most need are individuals who demonstrate something our guest calls intelligent disobedience by holding themselves and others accountable, and in doing so, averting catastrophe. Our host for today's episode is my colleague, Michael Siegel, Senior Education Specialist at the Federal Judicial Center. Michael, take it away. Thanks, Lori. Today we're going to talk with Ira Shalev, author of The Courageous Follower, Standing Up to and For Our Leaders, and Intelligent Disobedience, Doing Right When What You're Told to Do is Wrong. Ira is the founder and president of Executive Coaching and Consulting Associates in Washington, D.C. He's an adjunct faculty at the Federal Executive Institute and visiting leadership scholar at the Mahler Institute, Cambridge University in England. Mr. Shalef has served on the board of the International Leadership Association and as chairman emeritus of the Congressional Management Foundation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that provides management research and training to members of Congress and their staffs. Intelligent Disobedience was named the best new leadership book of 2015 by the University of San Diego School of Leadership and Education Science. Ira has been named one of the 100 best minds on leadership by Leadership Excellence magazine. Thanks for joining us, Ira. Oh, you're very welcome, Michael. The Federal Judicial Center was one of the first to identify the value of courageous following, and I was so pleased we did work many years ago and that um, you then integrated it into your own training curriculum, so it's great to be back in touch with you. That's a really nice memory, Ira. Thanks for bringing it up. We're going to turn now to the first portion of the episode focused on your book, The Courageous Follower. In that book, you say, the time has come for leaders and followers to develop and honor new models for relating to each other. That's a powerful statement. What do you mean by it? Well, we know that the historic model of the great man theory, and it was a man, um, is discredited. You know, that was a theory where uh, the leader had the vision, gave the orders, and everybody else followed. We know in a highly complex technical society that doesn't work. There is expertise at every level of our organizational systems, and that expertise has to flow both up and down, and leaders have to be as good listeners as they are communicators. And if that relationship is in balance, that's how leadership succeeds. So there's a fluidity and a dynamism to the relationship. Yes, absolutely. Most of us would prefer to see ourselves as leaders instead of followers. Yet you suggest that there can be great dignity and meaning in the follower role. In fact, most leaders are also followers. Can you elaborate? Yeah, I really like that word dignity, Michael. Thank you for calling it out. Sure. We know that in our culture and in other cultures, if someone says you're a follower, you can take umbrage at that. We're all supposed to be leaders. Well, I take issue with that, and I'll explain that. Mm -hmm. I believe that we have wrongly defined follower as a personality type. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about follower as a role. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we play a leader role, sometimes we play a follower role. You know, it's very obvious, you know, in the the court, um, you know, the... Chief clerk will have people that they are leading, and they will be following. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you do both with integrity and with strength? And that is what creates healthy leadership and healthy followership. Great. Yeah, I like the idea that, that followers are not a personality type, but rather they play a very important role in the organization. 
You go on, Ira, to describe forms of courage that are required by followers, such as the courage to assume responsibility. How might this play out in the workplace? Well, it's interesting that you uh, particularly called out the courage to assume responsibility. In my model, there are five forms of courage. Uh, There's the courage to support the leader, the courage to question or challenge if their ideas are not optimally serving the institution. There's the courage to take responsibility, which I'll come back to in a moment. And there's the courage to participate in transformation. Um, It's always easier to see what the other person needs to change than what we need to change ourselves for an optimum relationship. And then there's the courage to take an ethical stance when needed. Mm -hmm. I'm delighted that there have been many dissertations completed testing my model, and they've asked a variety of questions around the model. One of the more recent dissertations asked the question, do leaders value courageous follower behaviors? Mm -hmm. She wasn't sure that they would. Well, it turned out that they do value each of the behaviors, but the behavior they valued as much as all the others combined was this courage to assume responsibility. And what that means in essence is that once you understand the mission, once you understand your role in the mission, you don't wait around for orders. You take initiative, you act, and you accept responsibility for the decisions you make, for the initiative you take. Obviously, you do it within the overall framework of the organization. You don't start to uh, step outside of the bounds of your own part of the, of the mission, but you take full accountability and full initiative within that system. On the other hand, there may come a time when a follower has to have the courage to challenge a leader. I'm sure leaders like this less than the other courage. How does the follower summon the courage to do that, and can you provide an example? Okay, so first of all, um, let's make sure we have a common understanding of what we mean by challenge a leader. What I don't mean is challenge a leader's authority or their right to lead or their position as leader. What I do mean is, when necessary, to question or challenge the assumptions that they're working on, the information, if it's not correct, complete, or current, or the analysis that they make if you can see a significant flaw in it. So in essence, what we're trying to do, if the leader would step back and have some objectivity, we're trying to make sure that not only is the right thing done, but we're trying to make sure the leader looks good. No leader wants to be... Um, seen making a serious mistake, especially if the people around him or her uh, were aware of it and could have uh, warned them that they were about to make an egregious error and help them to correct that. So that's what we mean um, by the courage to challenge. What's an example? Well, first of all, we have to understand whether we're in the leader role or the follower role. We are human. And by definition, we are imperfect. Mm -hmm. So you may have a wonderful leader who has many virtues, but they also have a blind spot. Mm -hmm. So, for example, and this is something that most people who've been in the workforce for any amount of time have experienced, you may have a leader who runs very poor meetings. The meetings tend to go on much longer than scheduled, They don't follow an agenda for which people came prepared. They tend to go down rabbit holes. The leader gets sidetracked by something that's of particular interest to him or her, but may not be the optimum use of the group's time together. So this would be an example where a courageous follower took the leader aside and said, look, I know that you want to run the most effective and efficient operation possible. You've demonstrated that. I have some feedback on one area where there could be improvement. 
may I uh, or can we have that conversation now? Is this a good time? And the, of course, the leader will usually say yes or no. I'm busy. Come back at you know three o'clock, and then you lay it out. And you don't lay it out. Um, you lay it out in in careful language so that you're not blaming the leader, but you're helping him or her to understand the impact mm -hmm. of how the current uh, way of running the meeting is adversely affecting the group, and you offer solutions on how to potentially do it better. There's an art to this. Mm -hmm. uh, when we do workshops, as you know, Michael, we practice yeah. uh, this kind of conversation because it has to be done skillfully, but it won't be done unless the individual also finds the courage to initiate the conversation. What a great distinction you made between challenging the authority and challenging a practice or a program. And really, it's an act of support. It's not an act of subversion as you're presenting it. You're also, Ira, painting a picture of leaders who are receptive to the feedback. How do we find leaders or how do we develop leaders who are receptive to the feedback of their followers? Unfortunately, everybody thinks they're really good at this. <laughs> you know, everybody thinks, oh, no, I have an open door. People mm -hmm. can come in and tell me anything. Yeah. But then you find that there are certain responses that they have mm -hmm. during those conversations which actually discourage candor. So we have to spend a little time with people in their leader role, helping them to understand better ways of receiving this feedback that actually demonstrate that they really do want it, even if it's uncomfortable, and frankly, even if they may or may not ultimately accept the solutions that the person giving the feedback is offering, uh, it's not necessary that they accept those solutions. It's necessary that they understand what the person in the follow role is trying to bring to their attention and that they engage around that and find better ways uh, to perform that part of their leadership role. Excellent. And, and that they and that they trust the motivation of the people offering it. That's a great point. Yes, assume benign intent. So in the latest edition of your book, The Courageous Follower, you've added a chapter on the courage to speak to the hierarchy, which is intriguing. The judiciary is a hierarchical organization. What insights can you provide on the courage to speak to this or any other hierarchy? When I first developed the Courageous Follower model, in my mind, I was thinking, you, you might think more of, um, you know, my background was largely with congressional offices, as I think you know. Mm -hmm. So in, I was thinking about a chief of staff or a legislative director who had a very direct relationship with the member of Congress. And therefore, based on that re relationship, they could develop the trust and their judgment came to be respected. So they could give candid feedback that would be at least considered. Yeah, and um, that, that would be equivalent to the clerk and the chief judge. Exactly, yes. exactly. So that, um, you know, and that works fairly well. Later on, when I do executive coaching, especially in very large agencies, I realized that many times orders were coming from four or five levels above the individual. And in large bureaucracies, they could not necessarily realistically have a relationship with the, the top leader who is giving those orders or setting those priorities. And did this mean that they were helpless to have a voice in the matter or to get the system to consider changing based on the impacts the program or order was having. And I had to conclude that the answer was no, that's not acceptable. But now you had to find different strategies. So it may be, for example, let's say you see something backlogging in uh, your court system. And we all know, you know, that the courts are generally understaffed and, you know, the caseloads are enormous. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is something that I'm sure is wrestled with all the time. 
But let's say that you are three or four levels down and you see a situation where you have some ideas on how to potentially streamline the process so that it reduces the backlogging that occurs. But you don't have a platform from which to study that and voice it. Well, you might, for example, suggest up your chain of command um, that a task force be formed and you would be happy to serve on it. And that would then give you a platform to really examine the issue and lay out options that could really make a significant difference for the better, even though you were not formally in a position to have initiated that conversation um, and create the change. That's a great insight, and you'll be happy to know that this has actually happened in some of our courts. So it's a magnificent example of leading from anywhere, really. I have another question before we take a quick break. In the epilogue of your book, The Courageous Follower, you say, when leaders and followers fulfill their respective roles, they give each other the gift of being able to serve well. This sounds like it's really important to the public sector. Well, that's right. Most people in the public sector, I find, are drawn there, at least in part, because of a sense of desire to serve. The key is keeping the humanity in the system. As we know, you know, bureaucracies must have a lot of rules to govern them. And those rules are important because, you know, they do their best to make sure that personal individual bias is minimized and as much objective fairness, everybody is sort of judged by the same rules, etc., um, and yet, if we become totally rule-bound, we can lose our humanity. Mm-hmm. And that's how that sometimes uh, a bureaucracy will make a decision collectively that no individual <laughs> in that system would have made if they were completely authorized to use their judgment. So I think this is where... Um, to the degree we nurture our relationships between the different levels of the hierarchy, we see the humanity, we come back to this viewpoint of uh, benign intent on the part of everyone, even if we disagree with them or or sometimes are disappointed by, by their decisions. I think we keep making it possible for us to feel that we are in an organization with true human humanitarian values and that uh, we are part of keeping that spirit alive so that even though it is a legalistic culture and it must be it's also a human culture at the same time what a great note to move to the break on thank you for that inspirational comment we're going to take a quick break when we come back we're going to continue talking with iris shaliff about the courageous follower and intelligent disobedience. Hi, this is Paul Vambus, producer of the new FJC podcast, Off Paper. Mark Sherman, the head of the Probation and Pretrial Services Group at the FJC, hosts Off Paper and in every episode brings news, insights, and analysis about the best ways for probation and pretrial services officers to serve their clients and their communities and achieve the goals of the Charter for Excellence. Mark's guests are officers in the field sharing their experiences, academics in the criminal justice community sharing their findings, and practitioners at the national and local levels sharing their guidance. Episodes of Off Paper are available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as on fjc.dcn, fjc.gov, and the U.S. Court's YouTube channel. You can also subscribe to Off Paper using your smartphone's podcast app. So come on, you won't want to miss what's on Off Paper. Welcome back. I'm talking with Iris Shaliff, author of The Courageous Follower and Intelligent Disobedience. Okay, Ira, in this portion of the episode, we're going to focus on your book, Intelligent Disobedience. Ira, what is intelligent disobedience, and why did you start to address it? Intelligent disobedience is taken from the world of guide dog training, 
when uh, dogs are trained to support a person who is blind, of course they have to learn to obey all of the commands. But once in a while, the person who's blind may issue a command with, that would be unsafe to execute, like crossing the street when there's a quiet hybrid car coming around the corner. The dog must know when not to obey. And that is, um, a, if the dog cannot differentiate between when to obey and when not to obey, it can't be a guide dog because it can't assure the safety of the, the human being who is the leader in this case. So I realize that that is a very powerful metaphor for what we sometimes need to do when we're in the follower role vis-a-vis -vis our leaders who have a blind spot. You describe our primal instinct to obey authority, especially when that authority is cloaked in a doctor's gown, a pilot's uniform, or a judge's robe. And yet, surgeons, airline captains, judges, and others can issue commands that, if executed, could cause considerable harm. Can you explain how intelligent disobedience can, in these cases, prevent catastrophe? Uh, you're right that I do um, mention I, the word primal. More than primal, however, is the continuous reinforcement that we get from our earliest childhood forward on obeying authority. Every society needs to teach its young how to uh, obey the norms, the rules, and uh, the authority figures who are legitimate. What happens is we teach this very, very well, and we neglect to do what they do in guide dog training to also teach our children and then our professionals what are the exceptions to the rule when they should not obey if the order unintentionally or not would result in harm if executed. So this is something that I believe should be built in to professional training uh, wherever decisions are made that affect life, safety, and other core human values. That's really valuable insight for our listening audience. I want to come back now, though, to the methodology. Uh, let's say somebody even high up in the organization, like a clerk of the court, has a problem with uh, an order issued by a judge, to put it in our context. What would be the methodology to bring this to the attention of the leader? Well, there's two different responses based on how time-sensitive the matter is. For example, let's say that there is a, an active shooter event suddenly happens in a courtroom, mm -hmm. and um, the judge fails to absorb what's happening. The, you know, the clerk or um, one of the other officers of the court need to be willing to, to immediately take over and do what in guide dog training is called a counter pull. If the blind person is about to step off a dangerous edge, the dog is trained to pull them in the other direction. In an, in an immediately dangerous situation, that's how what intelligent disobedience looks like. More often, there's sufficient time to absorb uh, what, the, what the order you're getting is, compare it to the goals, the values, the cultural sensitivities, the evolving cultural sensitivities, and to then make a choice, should this order be complied with or should it be questioned? And if it should be questioned, overcome your own, if you will, socialization to just obey authority and instead find the best way to question the order. Whatever decision you make ultimately, whether to obey or not, you must remember you are accountable. We can never say, and this is you know, established jurisprudence, we can never say, I was just following orders. Mm -hmm. If you knew it was uh, an order that would result in harm, you have a responsibility to not comply, but instead try to get it changed. Excellent. You cite studies that have demonstrated over the years our inclination <clears throat> to obey. One of the most widely known of those is the Stanley Milgram experiments at Yale. Can you briefly tell us about this study? The Milgram experiments are the experiment where the subject thought that, that they were administering shocks to a, a learner, and the, uh, the authority figure was in a lab coat and issued orders to keep administering shocks. The, they weren't really shocks, but it was very convincing, and the subjects thought that they were doing so. 
two out of three people obeyed all the way to a potentially lethal level of shocks. Now, that part is pretty well known. The part that's not well known, which I emphasize in the book, is that Milgram then studied what was the difference between those who didn't obey. And it turned out that every, almost everyone experienced significant psychological stress about obeying when they knew it was wrong to obey. How they resolved that stress was the difference. The people who kept administering shocks sort of caved and said, he's the authority figure, he's responsible, I'm just going to do what he said. That resolved the stress, but not the ethics. The people who did not obey said, I'm going to resolve this stress by just saying, no, I don't care that you're the authority figure. I have a conscience, and I'm going to follow that. That also resolved the stress, but now did it in an ethical way. Hmm. That's very interesting. Toward the end of your book, you provide a compelling illustration of the power of intelligent disobedience from the annals of the tragedy of 9-11, and in particular, the actions of Richard Rescorla. Would you share an example to highlight the power intelligent disobedience can have? Yeah. In this case, he saved 2,800 lives. He was the security officer in uh, one of the towers. He had already observed the vulnerability based on the earlier bombing that had occurred. He was not able to convince management to relocate, but instead he sort of wrested from them an agreement that there would be a safety drill done every month on how to evacuate the building. And when the, uh, the, the, the first plane hit, orders were given for everyone to remain at their desk. He recognized that was a dangerous order. He ordered everyone, he disobeyed and ordered everyone to evacuate, and he got out everybody except two people, and he went back in to try to get them, and the building came down and he died uh, in, in that event as a true hero, having used the principle of intelligent disobedience, so he may not have used the terminology. That is a very, very compelling anecdote. Ira, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? I'll emphasize that intelligent disobedience is based on intelligent obedience. <laughs> most of the time, you know, courts are social structures, and most of the time everybody is following the established rules. It's just staying alert to when a specific order actually uh, would have an adverse consequence and shifting gears. And then um, for those who want to further um, inculcate the principles of courageous following or intelligent disobedience, I have found that there are reading groups in, in different agencies um, that just read a chapter uh, and have a brown bag lunch a week and discuss it, and that makes a, a significant difference in employee engagement and morale. So I'd, I'd like to just share that as well. Thanks so much. Those are really helpful. And thank you, Ira, for sharing your really important insights and research with us. We really appreciate it, and we wish you well as you go forward. Thanks, Michael. To hear more episodes of In Session, visit the Executive Education page on fjc.dcn and click or tap Podcast. You can also search for and subscribe to In Session on your mobile device. Produced by Jennifer Richter and directed by Craig Bowden. I'm Lori Murphy. Thanks for listening. Until next time.